Good afternoon. That's kind of hard to say, good afternoon. I think somebody told me they'd been saying good morning for an hour, so that's all right. But good afternoon to everyone. And we do have a good number with us today, and that's great. We were able to get out and fight the winter weather. Uh, we have visitors. We are certainly well, are glad you are in our uh, assembly today. I know we have some from other congregations visiting. Uh, a lot of schedules are changing, and we're certainly glad to have you with us today. If you would, take out a card from the rack in front of you and uh, sign that attendance card for us, please. The visitors use the red side, and we will take those up in a few minutes. I'd like to... Uh, uh, say thanks to uh, some people here for cleaning off our parking lot, without whom we certainly could not have uh, had our services today. But uh, I know Byron put a lot of hours out there, and we're certainly proud of that. We appreciate that, Byron. I think Bob will have something to say about it, too. Um, Kendall, I know he's been around helping. Mark and Kyla. Kyla's out with her broom. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of been a joke this week, uh, her sweeping the parking lot with the broom. So, But we're thankful, Kyla, for your assistance there. <laughs> um, we do have a nursery available if anyone needs that. Uh, it's out the foyer and down the hallway to the left. Again, we are glad to have everyone today. We are certainly glad that you are with us. As we begin our worship today, I would like to read Psalms 18 verses 1 through 3. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Let's begin our service. If it's convenient this morning, let's stand. <clears throat> we'll sing, We Have Come Into His House, and then we'll sing, I Stand in Awe. After we sing that song, Bill Morgan will lead us in prayer this morning. We
Would you pray with me, please? Father, it is good to be here to assemble as saints. Father, on the first day of the week, it is our desire and worship to draw near to you and your Son and remember Jesus Christ, the Savior. And Father, Father, it's good to be here to consider one another, to express our love to each other, our respect for each other in Christ. We're here, Father, to worship you. And the songs we've just sung are so motivating, the words are, and thank you for them and those that lead those, sing, those songs. Father, bless us as we worship you and we pray for those, Father, that may be having difficulty in the cold weather. Let us be aware of them and assist when we can. We're thankful for those that have helped prepare us, uh, make it convenient for us to worship today. Bless us now as we assemble and as we worship you and, and in this worship to you, Jesus Christ, our Son, your Son. Forgive us our sins, for it's in the name of Christ that we pray, and amen. To help us prepare our minds this morning for the partaking of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing Hallelujah, What a Savior. After we sing this song, Jason Perry will lead us in that part of our worship this morning. Today, as we partake in this memorial feast, remembering our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, I would like, like us to focus on the solemnness of this occasion. And in so doing, I'm going to read from Luke's account of Jesus' agony in the garden. In Luke 22, starting in verse 39, he writes, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. 
as we prepare our hearts and minds to partake of these emblems that represent Christ's body and his blood that was hung on that cross and the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. Let us turn our minds to the anguish that Christ endured as he prepared for the coming judgment, but be cheered by his willfulness to do it and to be in perfect obedience to the Father's will. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to assemble together as your people in communion with the saints, dear God, and in communion with you in remembrance of your Son. We thank you for his willingness to go to that cross, to endure the scorn and shame and the agony, dear God, and to allow his body to be hung upon that tree as a perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice which could forever take away our sins. Dear God, as we prepare to take this emblem, this bread that represents his body, help us to each one look into ourselves, examine ourselves, examine our actions and our attitudes, and make sure that we are right with you, dear God, so that in that last day, we may be found to be in Christ. Please bless us as we partake. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Luke 22, verse 20, after Jesus broke the bread, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As we prepare to take of this fruit of the vine that represents Christ's blood that washes away our sins, let us again examine ourselves. Let us go to the Father in prayer. Dear God, we once again come to you, giving you praise and honor and glory, and thanking you for the gift of your son Jesus, for his sacrifice on the cross. We thank you for that precious blood that was shed there, dear God, the only blood that could truly wash away our sins. Help us to live day by day in full remembrance of this, 
in remembrance of the price with which we were paid. Please bless us as we partake. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. this time we have concluded our observance of the Lord's Supper. We will engage in another avenue of worship, and that is of giving. We know that we are truly a blessed people and a blessed nation who have uh, received many, many spiritual blessings from God in Christ, and we've also received numerous physical blessings and it is our duty to return a portion of those for the Lord's service here at Benton. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for how richly you have blessed each one of us. Dear God, please help us as we examine ourselves and our means and cheerfully return a first portion of those material blessings back to you so that the work of this church may go forward and may increase and that much good may be done. We also ask that you would bless the elders and those who use these monies to, to further the cause of Christ, dear Lord, and to expand the kingdom here at Benton and also abroad. Please bless us as we give at this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
if it's convenient, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll stand at this, si at this time. We will sing, We Will Glorify. After we sing this song, Byron, I believe, has our scripture reading, Byron Rudd, and then Mark has our lesson. Uh, we will remain standing for the scripture reading after the song. <clears throat> Let's sing together. If you will, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We'll be reading verses 6 through 12. 1 Samuel 16, 6 through 12. So it was when they came that he looked at Elam and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the out, outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there is he, keeping his sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send him, or send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now was ruddy with brief eye, or bright eyes and good looking, and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. You may be seated. Good evening, or afternoon, or morning. It is hard to get my words straight when we meet at the wrong times. I searched my Bible over and over this morning to see where it says that we could meet at 1 o'clock. And I'm just not sure the authority is there. But it was fun sleeping in, and it was fun having breakfast and lunch and all that other stuff as we got here. So, And it feels good to be out of the house. Is there any amens with that one? Oh, yes, it feels good to be out of the house. Um, the snow is wonderful, and it's beautiful for a day, maybe two. And after a week, I'm ready to get out and see some folks and get out and do some things. It's been a um, funny week for me as we've been around. I sent off the uh, PowerPoints actually to another lesson Wednesday to uh, Jared and Scott and Dan Hall. They are the ones who work the PowerPoints and such. And I wrote underneath, I said, do you really think we'll have church Wednesday? And Jared responded, and he said, well, it depends on the weather. I was like, well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it would. And then um, Tuesday, um, I was over here with the boys, and we were shoveling, trying to make it where we could go in and out of the offices. I guess that was Monday. Was that? that was Monday. We were shoveling, trying to make it where people could go in and out of the offices pretty well. And uh, went around to Tom's area, got to the top of the steps, and had it cleaned off. I was feeling pretty good about myself. He opened the door and he said, you're all they sent? And I said, well, yeah, I guess I am, you know. But um, it's been a fun week. It's been a really fun uh, getting to know the kids again. Uh, getting to know the kids really, really well again. We've played every board game I think has ever existed and a couple they haven't invented yet. But um, I'm ready to get back to the regular thing that we do, to our regular da daily lives that we have. If you'll notice... Byron just read out of 1 Samuel chapter 16, and as you remember the context there, 
It's where Samuel is about to choose the next king over Israel. Four chapters earlier, we've chosen Saul. Saul has not worked out very well. Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. He was of a great family, of a great tribe, and it looked like he was going to do great. He was a great warrior. But as Saul continued along, we can see that while the outside looked right, the heart was not in the right place. Saul never could get over himself. He always saw himself as small. He always saw himself as insignificant. And because of his overcompensation, he oftentimes went against God and oftentimes went against the people. And so the time comes, 1 Samuel chapter 16, where Samuel is sent to go find the new king. And he's sent by God to the house of Jesse, and he begins looking through the sons, those first seven which are there. He saw Benadab, he saw Bilib, he saw Shammah. And he goes through and sees each one and recognizes this one's tall, this one's good looking, this one looks like a king. But over and over God says, no, this is not the one I've chosen. No, I'm looking for someone else. And as you continue along in that chapter after verse 7, you see David who is ruddy. David is a little bit shorter. David who is a keeper of sheep. David who is younger. And yet God chose him. Why? Because God could read the heart. Well, what I want us to talk about today in our lesson is about how we develop our heart and how we develop the hearts of the people who are around us. On first glance, as we go through this lesson, as I was putting it together, I was thinking about the aspect of parents raising children. But as I continued working with the lesson, I thought it it goes a little bit deeper. Because, yes, we want to shape our children in the way they should go. We want to lead our children to, if nothing else that they accomplish in life, to make it to heaven, to be a faithful New Testament Christian. That's not the only people we influence. We read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, that spouses, one of the main jobs they have in their Christian life is to influence their spouse, get closer to heaven, to be a better and a better and a better Christian. As you and I continue reading in Ephesians 6, starting in verse 6 and going through about verse 12, we see the importance of us as employees to try to show the love and the graciousness of Christ So that our masters, our employers, may see what it means truly to be a Christian. We also see that the owners, as we would say today, employers, need to recognize as they look upon their spouses, I mean not their spouses, as they look upon their employees, as they look upon the people they have authority over, they need to remember that they also have somebody looking over them, and that is God. And so in every relationship we're in, we are influencing someone. Whatever interaction you have with people, you influence those folks in some way. And so in thinking about that, I want us to explore the idea of David and notice why David was where he was. And a lot of it is because of his family. The first time you and I read about David is uh, even before he was born at the very end of the book of Ruth, over in Ruth chapter 4 and verse 17. And as you and I read about him there, this is many years before he's born. The uh, book of Ruth most likely would be uh, equivalent to about Judges 13 through 16. That is the time of Samson. That's probably when Ruth lived and when Ruth uh, had her influence within the nation of Israel after they left Moab. And you and I remember Ruth, four-chapter book, real simple and real easy. Uh, She lost her husband. She lost her father-in-law. She lost her brother-in-law. And while she could have been free to go back to her people to have a comfortable life, she still felt committed to Naomi. And so therefore, she returned back to Israel, to a foreign land with her, because she had pledged her allegiance. And as she continued to work to provide for her and her mother-in-law, she came across, providentially, Boaz. And eventually, Boaz recognized the responsibility he had as a kinsman redeemer to marry her. And Boaz and Ruth married And they had a son named Obed. Obed was faithful to God, and he had a son named Jesse. Jesse was faithful to God, and he had many sons, of which we've spoken of today, but the one we care about this morning is David. Now, as you and I look at David's heart, we see that many of the things that influenced him probably went all the way back to Boaz. And Boaz, since a responsibility. And many of the things which made David who he was went back all the way to his great-grandmother, that is Ruth. 
who showed her loyalty. And you see that idea of responsibility and loyalty to God and to friends and to family throughout the life of David. You see, you, a tree can't have fruit until it establishes a root. Now here in a few weeks, Lord willing, we'll all be starting with our garden. And as you and I get our gardens ready, as we put the fertilizer out, as we cultivate the field, as we determine the depth and the date exactly when to put that seed in, we recognize that a plant has to start under the ground before a plant can grow above the ground. Now, sometimes we forget about that principle in our Christian lives. And we want everybody to see how religious we are. We want everybody to see how great we are. We want everybody to see how holy we are above the surface when we haven't done the proper work underneath the ground. When we haven't really given our heart to God and diligently sought after Him. When we haven't developed a, a habit of study and a habit of prayer and a habit of service and good works. And so you and I see that if we don't have the root, we can never establish the fruit in the way that God would want us to do. Roots create fruits. That's something very, very, very important for us to remember. And so... As we look at that, I want us to continue looking at how our influence goes to other people, whether it's to children or to others. You see, other people, especially our children, are going to respond to the church the exact same way that you do. You ever had one of those days where somebody says, you look just like your parents? Or if you're talking to somebody and the words that come out of your mouth are the exact same words your parents use? Oh, isn't that aggravating? And you just don't want to look like your parents sometimes. Not to say that they're not good looking and not to say that, you know, they're not attractive in any way, but oh, it just hurts sometimes when you recognize that. Well, that may be true physically, and maybe you have your parents' hair, maybe you have your parents' nose, maybe you have your parents' physique, whatever it may be, but spiritually that is true more times than not. And so when you and I respond to the church, and the way that you and I respond to the church, most likely will be the way that our children respond to the church. The way that you and I respond to the church, most likely will be the way our spouse will respond to the church. And the way you and I respond to the church, most likely will be the way that our friends and the people whom we have influence over respond to the church. You see, we can fake it somewhat, but people see right through it. And it's possible for us to show up at the right building, at the right place, and at the right time, although I'm not sure it's the right time today, and actually sit on a pew and even have an assigned pew and still not be someone who respects the church and cares about the church. A study was done by Flavel Yakely a few years back and he said when both parents are actively faithful, there will be a 90% retention rate among their children. And that number sounds a little bit high to me, but that's the number he came across in his studies. And as he continues along there in his book about keeping children faithful, he says, let me take time to define what I mean by actively faithful. He said, first and foremost, that means the children are converted. What's it mean to be converted? It means to be changed by the gospel. To be changed to follow after the Lord. He said, secondly, they have to be equipped and not entertained. You see, sometimes in the Lord's church, we have a temptation to entertain. And we want to make things go so smoothly and things be so pretty. And we want to make things be so enjoyable that we'll have more and more people and visitors will come and the church will grow and we will all really enjoy our time here. But by entertaining... Sometimes we can develop weak Christians. One of the purposes we have of gathering together as a disciple, as a, as a body of disciples, is to equip. That is to train how to be faithful. To train to know how to convert other Christians. To train to know how to deal with temptations. To train to deal where people know how to repent and the importance of repentance, and the experience of repentance. Flavio Yakely says we need to entertain, no, excuse me, equip, and not just entertain. Thirdly, I thought was interesting, he said their parents preached to them. 
Oh boy, that would keep me faithful. Your parents preach to you as much as my parents preach to me. What do we mean when we talk about that idea of preaching? Well, the, the New Testament word is karuks. That means to proclaim the message of God. And it doesn't necessarily mean to always be in a preachy mode, but it means to repeat God's message. Your children, as they grow up, need to hear the words of Scripture and need you to be able to quote Scripture. Your children, as they grow up, need to know the Word of God. They need to know the plan of salvation and the Scriptures that go with the plan of salvation. They need to know why we worship the way we worship, whether it's taking the Lord's Supper, whether it's male leadership in the church, whether it's baptism for remission of sins. As we go through those things, they need to have the gospel preached to them. And they need to know God's word and what it is that's important. Our children and those who are around are going to respond to the Bible the same way that we respond to the Bible. How do people respond to the Bible? There's the three Ds, right? How do you respond to the Bible? First and foremost, there is the decoration version. You know what I'm talking about? You got your beautiful pew Bible that is on the coffee table, and it's really good because it holds cups, and it will not let the uh, tabletop get dirty, right? Some people have the decorative Bible because they have their Bible that they carry in and out of the auditorium, and they carry it in so everybody can see it, but it remains in the car all week. So it's ready for the next time you need to walk into the church building and hold it up, right? What's wrong with the decorative Bible? Nothing, as long as it's read and as long as it's studied. We live in a wonderful, wonderful time. When you and I on our cell phones and you and I on our iPads can download many, many, many different types of apps that will help us study. Many apps which will give us things which will help us be able to do Bible reading, which will remind us of good quotes, good verses to memorize or at least be uh, familiar with. We live in a wonderful time where we have a lot of helps to help us be religious and help us grow closer and closer to God. But don't have the decorative Bible. One that's used only to show off, used only to carry around, used only to make yourself feel better. If we go back to 1 Samuel chapter 4, Eli had two sons. Remember those two sons? Hophni and Phinehas. They were evil. They committed adultery at the front of the tabernacle. They stole from the Lord's sacrifices. And yet it was those two who were over the tabernacle, over the house of the Lord. Well, the time came to fight the Philistines. They did not have the spiritual backing which they needed, and they recognized they were going to lose. But Hophni and Phinehas took up what they called their decorative Bible, or what we'd call a decorative Bible, and they said, as long as we have this Ark of the Covenant, as long as we carry it into battle, God's not going to allow himself to lose if we've got the Ark with us. They went into battle, and guess what happened? The Philistines stole the Ark. And the ark was used as a, um, a joke among the Philistines, that is, until their god Dagon was destroyed and the Philistines sent it back because they, didn't, they couldn't handle the ark anymore. But could that be a problem with us? We think as long as I got my Bible in church, as long as I have this decorative Bible, and as long as I hold it up, and as long as I pretend that I really love it, I will be okay. That's not the influence we need. And our children and other people will be able to see through it. Well, the second D, which we look at, is, okay, well, the Bible is a sense of directions. In other words, it's a series of laws, a series of rules which you and I keep. I know, okay, um, this comes up, what needs to happen? Here's the plan of salvation, da-da-da. Here is the plan of worship, da-da-da. This is what we need to name the church. This is what we need to do at this occasion or that occasion or whatever else. And yet, sometimes, when we know the Word of God just as rules, we broken. There are some times where we think some rules than others. We keep the rules about worship, but then we let, apart, we let ourselves break the rules as far as how to take care of the poor and those who are lonely. We see these rules about homosexuality, and we preach those, but then we put aside the rules about fornication and about adultery 
And we say some are worse than others. You see the problem there when you see the Bible just as directions for living. But you and I read in our Bibles about the way in which we should view it. And that is discipleship. The idea of putting God first and foremost in our life and putting God's word into our heart. Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word, O Lord, have I placed in my heart that I may not sin against you. Moses said something about this as far as raising children, didn't he? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, he said, The word of God needs to be on your lips. You need to be talking about it when you're getting up and when you're laying down, when you're going out of the house, when you're coming in the house. It needs to be on your walls. It needs to be on your frontlets, on your clothing. It needs to always be everywhere. What's Moses saying by the inspiration of the Spirit? Your children, your friends, your spouse needs to hear you talking about spiritual things. God needs to be more important than the Dallas Cowboys. And he is, isn't he? God needs to be more important than the grades you made in algebra last week. And he is, isn't he? God needs to be more important than whatever the Kardashians did this last week. And there's no telling what they did this last week. I've been snowed in, I don't know. God needs to be more important than whatever political party is angry about whatever it may be. There is nothing in this world more important than God. Now, can you still watch the Dallas Cowboys? Absolutely. Can you still watch the Kardashians? Probably not. You can have other things in your life, but put God first and let God's word rule your heart, rule your life, and rule absolutely everything that there is about you. Put him first in everything. Your children, your friends will respond to others the way that you do. You know, we treat people in a certain way when we're in front of them. We get behind them. Sometimes we treat them a different way, don't we? Such a thing should not be. In James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, we see that in the Lord's church, everybody needs to be treated the same. Whether they're wealthy and popular, or whether they're poor and impopular. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20, John, writing by the inspiration of the Spirit, he says, how can you say that you love God if you hate your brother? Because remember this, your brother is made in the image of God. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, as Paul is finishing up his book to the Galatians, he says, therefore, as much as it is possible with us, let's do good to all men especially those who are of the household of faith. If you have children in your house, they need to see you caring about other people. Maybe there was an opportunity this week as far as shoveling sidewalks, as far as taking care of folks, making sure that they had food as you called on. Maybe as you go through the week, there's an opportunity when you visit somebody, whether they be in the hospital, whether they be at home, Maybe as you go through life, even here in the church building, there's an opportunity when people see you talking with folks, spending time with folks, caring about folks and the issues which they have. You see, you can't fake it. Your children know whether or not you care about other people. And they know your public face, and they also know your private face. Your friends and your spouses are the same way. Your children will respond to others the same way that you do. How do you forgive? How well do you forgive? Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21, Peter stands before Jesus. And he wants to show off a little bit because the Pharisees in that day said that you forgive somebody three times. Peter said, Lord, I'm going to forgive somebody seven times. And what did Jesus say to them? You don't need to forgive just seven. Some translations say 70 times seven. Some say 70 times 70. Not really good in math, but I know that's a bunch. What Jesus is saying is you forgive other folks. And you forgive them regularly. Forgive them over and over and over. Because recognize what he says at the end of that parable, because it mirrors what he says in the Sermon on the Mount. For as you forgive others, so also will your Heavenly Father forgive you. 
How long would you have lasted as a Christian if after you came out of that water, God said, okay, you got three, three mistakes you can make? How long would that last? Oh, boy. Or seven. Let's be liberal and say seven. Or 490. Boy, that would last about a year, <laughs> maybe. Maybe some of us could go longer. As you forgive other people, so also your Heavenly Father will forgive you. Have your children seen you be forgiving? That is, except for cleaning their rooms. Have your children seen you and your people, uh, folks around you, seen you show grace, show mercy the way that we need it from God? That's something very, very important for us to remember. The way our children think comes also from us. What is your view on money and possessions? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. What's it say? The love of money is a root of many kinds of evils. And there are many people who have pierced themselves through over and over. Timothy, as he reads that, he looks a little bit earlier. And what's it say? We came into this world with very little, with nothing. And we're also going to leave this world with nothing. I was watching a sermon this last week. And what the preacher said in that sermon is really all of us, all we are is a garage sale. It's all going, that's all that's going to be left when we leave this world is a garage sale. Somebody's got to get rid of all of our stuff because we can't take it to heaven. In the way in which you train your children, in the way in which you show influence to your friends, do you recognize how temporary stuff is? The rich man and the poor man are buried in the same cemetery. The rich man and the poor man look the same way in that cemetery after just a few months. What matters is not the stuff we've got, but our devotion that we have to God. That needs to be something that's trained. That needs to be something that's taught. That needs to be something which is believed. That needs to be something which we always hold to. What about what we view acceptably morally? In Galatians chapter 6, we see the works of the flesh, verses 19 through 21. Fornication, adultery, lewdness, drunkenness. And you and I can go through those idolatry. You and I can go through those five things, those six things which are mentioned. Do your children know from you that it is wrong to drink? Do your children know from you that it's wrong? Fornication is wrong. Do your children know it? from you about idolatry and about the dangers of idolatry. You see, covetousness is idolatry. Your children see in you what is good. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do they see that fruit of the Spirit, which is a result of giving our life completely to God? The way in which your kids respond to others comes absolutely from us. Many years ago, I lived in Mississippi. Mississippi is very different in Kentucky. It never snowed like this in Mississippi. But one thing I found really interesting was, you know, we lived in a very mixed culture. Um, in Jackson proper, Jackson, Mississippi, it's 98% African American. And the congregation where I preached, it was about 35, 40% African American. Marshall County is not that way at all. Does racism exist in Jackson, Mississippi? Yeah, it does. Does racism exist in Marshall County? Sure it does. Where is racism learned? It's not natural. It's not innate. Usually it's learned from parents. Usually it's learned from friends at school. Usually it's learned from people who are around us. If you want to live in a culture in a time that's not racist, you have to make a decision. You and I have to make a decision that we will not allow that to happen in our presence with our children, with the people that we're around. You see, that is one of those things that's important to our eternal salvation. We can't hate our brother and say we love God. And far too many people judge somebody by the way they look, by their history, or even something as silly as the color of their skin. We in the Lord's church need to lead our community and our country 
in the fact that all people are God's children and all people are right with them when they come to Christ. What about goals in life? What are the goals that you have in life and what goals do you try to instill in your children? Oftentimes I think, man, my children need to be rich because I'm a preacher. Well, really, getting back to truth, what really matters? What do you show to them as a goal? In Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14, we see the preacher, most likely Solomon. And he says, I haven't found happiness in relationships. Married to hundreds of women and never found happiness. I haven't found happiness in trying to build legacy and trying to build great monuments to myself. Worked hard at it, but never found happiness. I haven't found happiness by hoarding gold and silver. He was the richest man who's ever lived. And yet he did not find happiness. He did not find happiness in engaging and wanting pleasure and getting drunk and eating out all the time and everything he could find to give himself pleasure. He woke up after the hangover and found it didn't make him happy. And the word we see over and over and over in Ecclesiastes is vanity. It's like grasping the wind, trying to find happiness. So how does he close his book? He says, listen, this is the whole duty of man to seek God and keep his commandments and put him first in all things our children are going to respond to themselves the same way that we do are you self-centered is everything about pleasing yourself if you act that way where everything has to be about pleasing you and putting you first guess what your kids and those who are influenced by you are going to be the exact same way. That's why it's so important that we be a people of service. In John 13, Jesus washed feet. The job of the lowest slave, Jesus, the Son of God, did it. Why? He tells his apostles later, what I am doing, you must do also. There are some religious groups who falsely teach that that means that we wash feet in worship service. That's not a need, and that wasn't what Jesus was after. What Jesus was after was saying that every single one of his disciples needs to be a servant. You need to find a way to serve, to put other people before you. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, you always, as we read through that passage, need to put the other needs of other people above your own, to in lowliness seek to put other people first. In verse 5, have that mind, that attitude that Christ Jesus had. Be willing, if you are Jesus, to not consider equality of God's son to be grass, but make yourself nothing. Be like Timothy in that passage, and Epaphroditus in that passage, and Paul in that passage, who gave up, who served. Your children need to see you serve. Now, how do you serve? Teach in Bible class. How do you serve? Helping out, cleaning around the building. How do you serve? Checking on those folks who need to be visited. How do you serve? If nothing else, pray. But be a person of service. They need to see that service so that they're not self-centered. We need to put other people first. The last point I want us to look at is our children are going to respond to sin the way that we do. We have a lot of first-generation Christians in this room. And if you're a first-generation Christian, that is, if you're the first person in your family to have been converted, you're to be greatly treasured. Because that means that you had the courage to stand up against the family tradition which you had and accept the gospel and obey it. You had the faith in God to trust what the Bible says and the Bible alone says to stand up and say, I believe. To stand up and be baptized for remission of sins and to be faithful. But there's many of us in this room who are Christians. And one of the reasons why we're Christians, there are many, is because our parents showed us the way and taught us the way from when we were young. Recognize the influence that parents and family have. And as you think about that influence... Look and see what that influence is. How do you respond to sin? Do you brush it away and say it really doesn't matter? Or do you really see what repentance is about? 
Repentance is not conforming to the world, but being transformed by the power of God. Repentance is not just being sorry that you got caught, but it's the answer of a good conscience towards God. Repentance is a change in your life as you grow and as you learn. Repentance is not something you do just the day you become a Christian. It's something that you work with for the rest of your life. Every one of us needs to repent and grow closer and closer to God. What is it in your life that caused you to obey the gospel? Many of us, as we lined up today, would have many different stories. Perhaps it was a sermon. Perhaps it was a book. Perhaps it was a Bible class teacher. Perhaps it was a parent. What was it that caused you to obey the gospel? Recognize the influence that you have on others who are following that journey as well. Put God first in everything that you do. Recognize that very first principle that we looked at this afternoon. If a tree is going to have fruit, it must first have roots. Where are your roots? Who are you when you boil it down, when you look deep under the surface How closely are you walking with God? Yes, it's good to be in church services. It's commanded, and we love you being here. Yes, it's good seeing the many public works which this congregation is well known for, both here and throughout the world. But be like David, a man after God's heart. A man who, while other people may not be able to see it, God recognizes your faithfulness, your first love, and your devotion to him. This afternoon, if the invitation applies to you, if you need to obey the gospel, if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward while we stand and while we sing. to express who you are and for what you've done <clears throat> for all sin of sending your son actually yours and we're grateful father father we know that you are aware of the needs of our heart we know that you know before we do we'll do that now regarding many who are sick and suffering, and hardship, and grief. Father, we pray that you'll be mindful of each one of those. And we know that you know precisely what each one needs. And Father, we pray that if it's within your providence, you will provide them the recovery, the stability, the confidence that they need in their lives. Bless each one, Lord. Thank you, because we know from your word that every good and perfect gift comes down. Father, we're so grateful and we're so humbled by your care, concern for the safety that we've had in this period of it, for your watching over us through that. Be with us not just today, but each day and every day be together in heaven. Father, forgive us when we fail. Help us in the ways that we need help. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Some of those who are suffering, who are ill, 
have had surgery and facing, <coughs> facing situations in their life. First, I want to mention Gerald in Nashville, as you know, and it turned out to be far more difficult than during the recovery phase. And Gerald is at home now, but he still is having problems. And, and I'm going to ask you each of them if you have an opportunity. So let's remember Gerald. I want to mention now Jeremy Smitely. Jeremy had a tonsillectomy from Sheila May's address, Sheila May Collins' address, and cards would be greatly appreciated. I want to mention also uh, Sid Darrington had surgery this past Friday. He is in Lourdes Hospital, room 511, and the family requests prayers for him because his, condi <clears throat> his condition is serious. She's a former member, member of the Benton congregation. She has been in the hospital and is currently residing in Lakeway Nursing Home. Now I know there must be many others about whom we're not aware. So just keep all of those that you know about in, in your mind and pray for them on a daily basis. Have some general job that Byron and Kendall did in taking care of the parking lot. Now I'm telling you, I walked out after the snow had come and I said, this is not good. I'm sharp that way. I picked up on that right away. And these guys worked not just one day, not just two days, but multiple days out here clearing the parking lot. And we are grateful to them for that. I wish I had had a photograph of Mark with the shovel in his hand because I understand he performed a yeoman service out here with the shovels cleaning out around the doors, doorways. And Kyla, as has been mentioned already, did broom action out here in the parking lot and we we're proud about that. Also, I want to mention last Wednesday night as you know, obviously, there was no assembly because of the weather, but there was a service that emanated from this building. Mark, Matthew, and Nason did a three-man band on providing a service that went out over the Internet, and we're grateful to them, and that was an outstanding thing, and we appreciate it very, very much. Thank you for that. Remind you also that Jeff Jones needs teachers. Jeff Jones wants teachers. For that to happen, somebody has got to step up and be willing to teach K through the third grade for all of those hordes of people who will get the job, okay? Lewistown, Montana mission trip is looming in the future, and they're in room 52 for any and all of those who wish to go. If you have any questions about that, please call Jared. Jared, you're the man on that, right? No, Sunday, night. Sunday night after services. Okay, thank you. Sunday night. Does anyone have anything further that should? Okay. Okay. And potluck Wednesday night. Let's keep those things in mind. Anything more from anyone that we need to mention now before we're dismissed? Okay, there being another, nothing further, we're dismissed. Thank you for being here. One last thing, let me commend each of you who are here because that's incredible. We have a wonderful number. Thank you.